Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Scott Kilpatrick. Uh, I'm the Director of Orthopedic Pathology at the Cleveland Clinic. And today I'd like to talk to you about updates uh, in the recent fifth edition of the WHO uh, Soft Tissue and Bone Manual. And specifically, we're going to focus on uh, those aspects of bone that have changed between the fourth and fifth editions. Uh, obviously, with the limited amount of time we have, it's impossible to cover uh, the content that has changed. But I've focused this on some specific areas, so I hope to give you at least an overview of what has changed between the two editions and what is, is significant to know. Um, and these are some categories I've put in here. Uh, first of all, there's a, a new category, undifferentiated small round cell sarcomas of bone and soft tissue. We're going to go into that in more detail. Uh, secondly, the chordoma classification has changed uh, in specifically as it relates to dedifferentiated chordoma and poorly differentiated chordoma are now represented in their own categories. Uh, the ACT, the atypical cartilaginous tumor grade one chondrosarcoma concept, has expanded such that now we have sections as it relates to both central and peripheral chondrosarcomas, uh, and these are all clearly separated within the fifth edition. Uh, there's been uh, some consolidation on the osteosarcoma subtypes. Uh, the osteoclastic giant cell rich tumor category has changed. We'll talk about that in more detail. Another thing you may notice is that the fifth edition does include hematopoietic tumors uh, that were originally not included in the fourth edition entities such as Langerhans cell histiocytosis, Erdheim Chester disease, and Rosai Dorfman disease are now discussed uh, in uh, the bone portion of the fifth edition of the WHO. So specifically as it relates to undifferentiated sarcoma, uh, the fourth edition of the WHO, and bear in mind this was 2013 when this was uh, finalized, had a category called undifferentiated unclassified sarcomas. And in that category, they included the small round cell, which was mainly the CIC rearranged sarcomas and the undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. I, I should point out that in the bone section of the fourth edition, uh, UPS, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma did exist as a separate entity, but it did not in the soft tissue portion. Ewing sarcoma in the fourth edition was a separate category as, as was expected, but the discussion of Ewing sarcoma included uh, sarcomas that resembled Ewing's that were now categorizing uh, as separate entities, the so-called Ewing-like sarcoma group. So the fifth edition now has a category, a separate category, undifferentiated small round cell sarcomas of bone and soft tissue that includes uh, these four entities of which we're gonna go into in more detail. Okay, so one of the things that's happened in the last seven years is we have been able to more narrowly define what we mean when we say Ewing sarcoma. Uh, when I was uh, starting out in practice, uh, Ewing sarcoma was kind of a catch-all for a small round cell sarcoma of bone, and it included a category called atypical Ewing sarcoma that we now recognize probably was not classic Ewing sarcoma, and, and had we had the techniques uh, back then that we had today, we would have classified it differently. But looking at Ewing sarcoma today, we can say that Ewing sarcoma is at a minimum a, a small round cell sarcoma formed by fusions between the TET or FET family of RNA, bi or RNA binding proteins, that's usually EWSR1, which most of you are familiar with, and rarely the fused in sarcoma gene, FUS gene, uh, and this, is, uh, this involves an E26 transformation specific gene, of which the most common are FLY1 and secondly, ERG. Uh, for the most part, the Ewing sarcoma demographics have remained largely similar because again, this is overwhelmingly the most common category of tumors uh, in that undifferentiated small round cell sarcoma classification. These patients are five to 25 years of age, typically rare in infants, uh, males more common than females, extremely rare in African Americans. Uh, bone is more common than soft tissue, particularly the, the diaphyseal and diametaphyseal regions of the long bones, pelvis, and ribs. Of the 15% or so that are extraskeletal, they tend to occur in a slightly older population. Um, when you think about Ewing sarcoma, uh, by this definition, if you, you think of a very uniform small round cell sarcoma as you see in the upper right hand corner, and that tumor is classically strongly and diffusely positive for CD99. 
Uh, as we get into the other sarcomas that may have fallen into that category of atypical Ewing sarcoma or Ewing's like round cell, uh, bear in mind one theme, a couple of themes that they share. If you see a Ewing's, a Ewing's like sarcoma that does not have this uniform round cell morphology, shows more atypia or more spindling, think about something other than Ewing's. If you see a stroma that's either myxoid or myxoid hyaline, uh, think about something other than Ewing's sarcoma. If the tumor does not stain diffusely and strongly positive for CD99, if it's patchy, uh, focal, cytoplasmic, think about something other than Ewing sarcoma. To make the diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma by the WHO, the essential features are for, for it to be a small round cell sarcoma with this diffuse and strong membrane of CD99 staining. And of course, desirable is to have molecular confirmation. So against that backdrop, we have three entities we're gonna talk about. Of those entities, this is by far the rarest entity and it's the one that we know the least about. And that is those rare Ewing-like round cell sarcomas that have EWSR1 type fusions or FUS type fusions with non-ETS genes. Um, there's a variety of genes that fall into this category. Most of what we know demographically are about NFATC2 and PATZ1. We're going to focus more on the NFATC2s. So we have a little more data on that. What we know about NFATC2 is that this can affect a, a variety of patients through a large age range, but like Ewing's, it's more common in males and in bone than in soft tissue. But as you can see, the morphology is quite different. The morphology ranges from this kind of round to spindle type, often in nests and cords and ribbons, uh, and it can even be somewhat spindled. And the stroma is this kind of peculiar mixohyaline, the fibrocollagenous type uh, of background. C99 is variable. In most of these uh, cases, it's either going to be patchy or negative. The limited amount of data that we have suggests that this tumor may be more aggressive than Ewing sarcoma, but we're still looking into this. And again, it's, it's the, of the categories we're going to discuss, it's the one we know least about. The one we know the most about and the most common of the Ewing-like round cell sarcomas are the so-called CIC rearranged sarcomas. Um, these sarcomas have actually been known about for quite some time, but only recently categorized and have been uh, sort of known to involve chromosome uh, or, or translocation between 4 and 19 and 10 and 19. The age range is a little older than Ewing's. Typically, young adults are the ones who get this slight male predominance, and this tumor is by far more common in the soft tissues of the trunk and extremities than it is in bone, where it is less than 5% of total cases. As you can see over here on the right-hand side, CD99 is variable and patchy in this. It doesn't show that diffuse membranous positivity. We do have a very good nuclear marker with DUX4 that in my experience with about a half a dozen cases has been consistently positive uh, in those cases that have been molecularly uh, uh, proven to be CIC rearranged sarcoma. So I really like this stain. Uh, if you look at the morphology of this tumor, you can see what I was talking about earlier. This in the past might have been called an atypical Ewing's. The cytology of the cells is significantly more atypical, uh, a little more abundant, almost vacuolated cytoplasm, big round nuclei, variation size and shape, prominent nucleoli, and often has a, a myxoid stroma, not much different than we saw with uh, the previous small round cell sarcomas that have the NFATC2 fusions. But importantly, this is a distinction that's important to make because based on the data we have and we have enough cases to make this with, with total confidence, the patients with these tumors do poorly. This is a very aggressive lesion. These lesions respond poorly to chemotherapy regimens. Very important tumor to actually recognize uh, specifically. Now, the last one we're going to talk about, the sarcomas with the B-core genetic alterations. This is kind of a heterogeneous group of tumors. We're going to focus mainly on those B-core uh, round cell sarcomas that are that involve a fusion to the cyclin B3 gene. Those are the ones that are mo most likely to mimic uh, Ewing sarcoma. And it's interesting, despite having completely different, uh, you know, uh, molecular characteristics, uh, the tumor has remarkably similar uh, demographics, uh, pathology, uh, and outcome 
to classic Ewing sarcoma with some notable differences. Oh, so first of all, you look at the mean age around 15 years, males more common than females, bone is typically more commonly involved in soft tissue, and this is especially the long bones that are involved like Ewing sarcoma, but it rarely can have visceral involvement of which the most common site is the kidney. If you look at these tumor cells, they bear some resemblance to a uh, classic Ewing sarcoma. They're typically round, they can show some atypia, they can even show some spindling, but like the CIC rearranged sarcomas, they may have areas that have a sort of lightly mixoid to mixohyalinized stroma. As I pointed out earlier, among all these Ewing-like round cell sarcomas, CD99 is typically patchy. Although I will tell you, I've, I have seen at least one case that had a diffuse and strong membrane of CD99 stain pattern, but that is definitely the exception, uh, not the rule. These are also uh, frequently strongly diffusely positive for SATB2. Uh, SATB2 is classically negative in Ewing sarcoma, and I find this somewhat ironic because there are a few cases of B-core described in the literature that were associated with bone formation. Uh, that's led uh, uh, some of us to believe that what we've classified as small cell osteosarcoma in the past may be a heterogeneous group of tumors, some of which may actually be B-core rearranged sarcomas. If you look at the outcome data in these tumors, very similar to classic Ewing sarcoma. They respond very well to the usual Ewing sarcoma regimen. Uh, Five-year survival rates are statistically similar to these tumors. Some people suggest they may have a slightly better prognosis. Okay, among the osteosarcomas, there really hasn't been much changed, except you'll notice that some categorizations have actually changed. Uh, in the fourth edition, uh, we had uh, as, as standalone entities, conventional high-grade osteosarcoma, telangic paddock osteosarcoma, and small cell osteosarcoma. Uh, in the fifth edition, we have simply a category of osteosarcoma, which is basically defined as intermedially high-grade uh, you know, sarcoma that makes bone. And within that category are the subcategories of conventional high-grade osteosarcoma with its osteoblastic, chondroblastic, and fibroblastic subtypes, telangic paddock osteosarcoma, and small cell osteosarcoma. And as I mentioned to you earlier, I believe that probably most examples of small cell osteosarcoma may in fact be an, an, another entity. It's quite rare, and I've only seen uh, you know, a couple of cases in my life that I think even qualified for that diagnosis. Now, one category of tumors we should mention uh, before we run out of time here is the USP6 rearranged family of tumors because this particular category of, of lesions has brought forth changes in how we think about uh, tumors in both the soft tissue and bone sections of the WHO manual. Uh, many of these lesions, as, as you know, over my lifetime, we consider many of these lesions pseudoneoplasms or even reactive processes, uh, but we now know that they probably are uh, true uh, benign neoplasms. And we won't go into all these because only a couple of these actually relate to the bone tumor section. Uh, the fibrosis pseudotumor of the digits and mouse size of hands were classified together in the fourth edition and they remain together for the fifth edition. But one change that has occurred is with giant cell lesion of the digits and aneurysmal bone cyst. Now, I will tell you that we've known for quite some time that giant cell lesion of the small bones, also known as giant cell repair granuloma, had a lot of overlap with aneurysmal bone cysts. And those of us who've been doing, who have been signing out bone tumors for many years, have also seen cases of ABC uh, of the digits recur like a giant cell repair granuloma and vice versa. So it, this is not really surprising. If you look at the demographics, there's a significant amount of overlap between these lesions. But with the sharing of these gene rearrangements uh, being undoubtedly proven, uh, giant cell lesion of the bone is no longer a standalone category. It's now included uh, under the rubric aneurysmal bone cyst, and aneurysmal bone cyst, giant cell tumor of bone, and non-ossifying fibroma are now under the broad category of osteoclastic giant cell rich lesions. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, there's a lot more that we could discuss, but for the sake of time, uh, I think this is an overall summary of the changes that occurred between WHO 4th and WHO 5th editions. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this talk. Bye now.